In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, well, there he is. He's among them. How in the world did he get in? Through the window? Through the door? No. They probably wouldn't unlock or open either one. He's just there, smack dab in their midst. And why not? He's the Lord. And he's having a church. So he stands among sinners. Those who've sinned against him. Uh, You're sinners too. And sin is what keeps you, just like the disciples, locked up in fear. Be honest, would you? Come on. Stop lying. You're afraid to talk honestly about your sin, aren't you? You're afraid to confess them. You're scared to look at them in the mirror of the law. You've perfected covering them up under piles of excuses, self-sacrifices, self-justification, fill in the blank. You cover your sins under your Sunday best, an old trick learned from Adam and Eve who hid from God's judgment behind self-stitched fig leaf breeches and bra. Now that sounds quite silly, doesn't it? It's supposed to, because hiding from God behind anything you've done or attempt to do is utterly ridiculous, futile, hellacious. Behold, the Good Friday Savior of sinners stands among sinners with all their sin. Will he Arnold Schwarzenegger it? John Wick it? Or Wrath of God it? All over them? And you? It's what they and you deserve. Instead, he gives them what they do not deserve. Peace be with you, he says. He's not at war with them, but at peace. All is right. All is forgiven. They are Good Friday, covered in his atoning blood. I wondered if I'd have to move that. (laughs) Proof and source of that peace are his cruciform wounds. They're showing. He doesn't hide those wounds. The peace of Jesus is not some hollow religious wish. It is the peace with God the Father who has reconciled the world to himself in the Good Friday death of his beloved Son. From his Good Friday wounds come your forgiveness, your life, and your salvation. Isaiah said it this way, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us (laughs) peace, and with his stripes, We are healed. Yes, brothers and sisters, his wounds express the Good Friday sacrifice. Here is the redemption price. The price of your freedom. The price of your forgiveness. Yes, Jesus is the sacrificial lamb offered for the sins of the world, for your sins, for the disciples. And then another peace be with you. He breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. It was a little Pentecost in preview. Fifty days later, the big one. Here, Jesus establishes his apostolic ministry. It's their ordination, sending them with divine authority. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. His breath, his words, his spirit, his forgiveness, his peace. The sins his sent ones are to forgive are forgiven. What they retain is retained. As certain on earth as though Christ himself were speaking. (laughs) And he is. That's the nature of apostolic ministry. He who hears you hears me. Luke 10. Brothers and sisters, in John 20, Jesus then guarantees that his voice gets heard in the church. John 20 is not just the sending of a few, but the creation of an office. The office of the holy ministry, by which sins are forgiven or not forgiven. Jesus is present with his gathered church, his body, his blood, his wounds of his sacrifice, his peace and forgiveness, his spirit, his breath, all for you. This is the foundation of Christian worship and liturgy. (laughs) The only difference, 
between that upper room and this room is that our doors aren't locked and we can't see Jesus. But the same wounds, the same words, the same spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. Our Lord's words and breath give what they say. So you don't have to look to heaven or in your heart for divine forgiveness. Look for the mouth of the pastor and listen with your ears. The Lord's forgiveness is something spoken and heard. In the liturgy of personal confession or private confession, the pastor asks a very important question. Do you believe that my forgiveness is God's forgiveness? The point? (laughs) Old man Kuhlman's forgiveness won't do you a bit of eternal good. It may make peace between us, but not between you and God. Only God's forgiveness can do that, and it comes to you from Christ through his church in which the pastor speaks. The church, you remember, Luther said, is a mouthhouse of forgiveness. In the church, forgiveness is to be spoken and therefore given. That's what the office of the holy ministry is about. In fact, that's all it's good for, forgiveness, freely given by grace, freely received through faith. Now, if you don't want to be given such a gift, if you refuse it in unrepentant unbelief, then I am here to tell you that you will not be forgiven. Forgiveness will be withheld from you. You will still be wrapped up in your sin, and you will have to answer for it on your own. And that, I can guarantee, will be hellishly and eternally hellacious. Don't go there. I beg you. Oh, and by the way, don't blame Jesus if that happens either. He wants to forgive you. He has Good Friday shed his blood for you. He gave you his divine and saving name in holy baptism. Today, he gives you his body and his blood with the promise given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sin. Sins forgiven, sins retained. We call it the office of the keys, the keys that lock and unlock heaven itself by applying the forgiveness that Jesus won for you with his words. Brothers and sisters, the words, I forgive you all your sins spoken in the stead and by the command of the Lord Jesus Christ are the surest words there are on earth. They come by way of the Good Friday cross and the empty tomb. They come with our Lord's breath in view of his wounds. They justify the sinner. They are spirit and they are life. They are the words of eternal life. Brothers and sisters, learn to cherish them. Believe them. Cling to them. If you have nothing else but those words, you have all that Jesus died to win for you. In the name of Jesus. 